know, I always mention there are outlines through the uh, back door and to the right-hand side. If you go and get one, you will notice this evening, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, answering one of the hardest questions we deal with as we try to evangelize or teach the lost. And so we'll spend some time talking about that this evening. This morning we're going to look at maybe a topic that's a little bit more difficult. And we're going to look at the topic of can we be honest with ourselves. I think for many of us this is an extremely difficult topic. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 4 verses 3 through 5 just as we start to get a little bit of an intro into uh, being honest with ourselves. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 3. Paul, writing to the church there in Corinth, says this, But with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. And therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Now, I brought that passage up because, and there's a number of verses we could look at, but we know from the Bible very clearly that man is going to be judged. He's going to be judged by God. He's going to be judged by other men, but as you talk about this judging process, we probably ought to ask ourselves, what about ourselves? Do you sometimes think about the things you do or the things you're involved in? Do you judge yourself? You go back into the first century, there was a very common phrase used. You probably are very familiar with it. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, know thyself? It's a common first century phrase that we would hear. You still hear it today. That was actually the inscription on the temple to Apollo at ancient Delphi, and this was a very common saying. It was used by many of these Greek philosophers who would go out and they would stand on the street and they would, they would preach and they would teach. And as you begin to think about that phrase, knowing yourself or know thyself, I don't think anywhere there's a, a more accurate uh, knowledge of self-importance than it relates to our standing with God. I mean, whether we're righteous or whether we're not righteous. As you begin to talk about knowing yourself, I don't think anything uh, is more important than where we stand with God. Certainly, that's something we want to know. And that's because as you begin to go back and study the New Testament, whether you're not yet a believer or whether you are a believer, we know that the New Testament requires repentance. One, to even become a Christian, but two, once you're already a, a Christian. And as you think about repentance, repentance requires for us to have a conscience, a conscience. More specifically, one that's, that's calibrated correctly. Notice 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, our conscience involves self-knowledge, and it has to also involve honesty. Now, you go back and you look at that word conscience. I won't spend much time on it, but it's made up of two parts. Con, you see the first part, con, and then you see the second part, science. Uh, and it's related to our word that we use, conscious, but it literally means to know within yourselves. And that's what your conscience is doing, especially one that's uh, been uh, accurately in alignment with the scriptures. We have to know ourselves if we want to get to heaven. But here's the question, can we be honest with ourselves? I've thought quite a bit about this throughout the week, especially as I've followed a number of discussions going on with different people. Well, let's talk first a little bit about the advantage of knowing ourselves. I think that if we were to, to go back and fill out questionnaires based on how much we know about people, I think most of us would probably do the best on answering questions about ourselves. And that's because, to be honest, we know ourselves best. Uh, there are other people out in the, in the world or maybe even in the church that they know things about us. They may know our thoughts. They may know our motives. They may know our, our uh, aspirations. They may, may know things that we're involved in. But they really only know them so much as we either reveal them to them by speaking with them or as we carry them out in our life. Some people that we deal with, they know a lot about us. Some people only know a little about us. And there's a number of reasons uh, that they may not know a bunch about us. Many people are very protective. They're very protective of relaying information to other people about themselves. And there's a number of reasons why, and I won't go into all of them, but some people are very protective about their thoughts and their actions 
either because they're afraid that they may be judged or maybe because they actually know they're doing something wrong and they're afraid that they'll be judged. Some people are just very personal people. And I think many of you probably know people like that. I bring this up because oftentimes when others judge us, uh, it is at best incomplete and it is oftentimes inaccurate. But that shouldn't be the case with us as we evaluate ourselves. I want you to listen to 2 Timothy 2.15. It's a passage you all know very well. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Simply put, before I move on to the next point, it's simply this. We as, uh, as Christians, we know the most about ourselves. We know the most about the things that we're involved in. We know the most about the things that we believe. And yet, when you go back and you look at 2 Timothy 2.15, here's the point. We're, just, we're to know the Word of God, and we're to use that based on the knowledge of ourselves so that we can be in alignment with God's will. Other people around us may know a little about us. They may know, they may know some about us. They may just have a false uh, viewpoint about us, but that shouldn't be the case with us. We actually have the advantage in knowing ourselves, but there's also a disadvantage in knowing ourselves. I think as we look at this, you guys will, all, uh, will probably agree here. Yeah, we probably do know ourselves the best. But I think most of you also realize this, that it is often the case where we are very poor judges of ourselves. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. We, we may have the knowledge from which we can make an accurate self-evaluation. But the problem is, is we don't truly see ourselves as we are because we can't be objective looking in the mirror. Here's what I really mean. I may be involved in something, and I may not think that what it is that I'm involved in is very bad. Let me use a worldly example. Let's say you've got a person, I guess it's possible you've got a Christian dealing with this, but let's say you have a person who's dealing with alcoholism. You know, when I was studying this issue, there's a very low percentage of alcoholics that would actually admit that they are alcoholics. But it's funny that when you look at it as a topic such as that and you bring it into the spiritual realm, you'll oftentimes find people who are very spiritual who have beliefs on certain matters who also have a hard time admitting now that they may have an issue in that. Uh, this is, it's also true in the physical world. You guys know doctors? Doctors, uh, they view and heal or help heal and, and treat people. You know, doctors aren't supposed to self-diagnose themselves. The doctors are actually supposed to go to another doctor. That doctor is to then be very objective and to look at them and to help them deal with an issue if they have it. Well, when you begin to talk about spiritual things, because uh, sometimes we are not our best, our, our best uh, judge, sometimes it's better to go to somebody. <clears throat> and it's better to begin to ask them or to to have them help you to understand those things about yourselves or maybe to see those things that you can't see. We as, as people oftentimes will lessen the severity of, of things that we're involved in. And again, it would go back to a number of examples that you could give. But as I was thinking about this this morning, specifically I was thinking about when Jesus was talking about trying to take that little speck out of the eye when you've got the old plank in your own eye. You go back and look at that there in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. It's funny how we can see something so small or, or a problem that's so little in someone else's life, and yet we may have a huge problem in our own life, and yet we lessen the value of it. Or we honestly just can't seem to see it because we have that plank in our eye. Sometimes it takes another faithful Christian to come and to help you get an understanding of the things that you're really dealing with. I began to think a little bit about that, and because we're often blind, sometimes that's the best manner. There are a number of people who are, who are uh, dealing with things and maybe have a wrong understanding. And how is it that they can have a right understanding unless somebody who knows the truth would come and sit and talk with them? For many, this comes across as being um, very confrontational. And sometimes it can be. But I began to think a little bit about this, and I could give, a, there are so many examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm just, going to give, I'm just going to give one from each. You go back and you think about David's adultery with Bathsheba. But it wasn't just adultery with Bathsheba. He actually had Uriah the Hittite murdered. You go back and look in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 15. 
Nathan, a prophet of God, and I'm going to say here actually a true friend of David, he comes and he confronts David. And it was only after Nathan confronted David that David was even willing to admit the things that he had been involved in. Did that seem confrontational? Well, let me say this. I don't think there's a whole lot of people at the time when David was alive who were willing to come and tell the king he was both an, an adulterer and a, and a murderer. But Nathan did. Nathan was a prophet of God. Nathan was also one of David's true friends, as you see in him coming and telling, the, telling him the truth. Probably did come across initially as confrontational. I then began to think a little bit about Peter. Go to Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Now, this is an account many of you are familiar with. <clears throat> And I tried to place myself in, in Peter's uh, footsteps and, and his shoes here as this was going on. Think about how he must have felt initially. But you look at a problem that was, that was taking place. He was a hypocrite. In Galatians 2.11, we find this. But when Peter was come to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come... He withdrew, and he separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, talking about those who had, who had been Jews, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as, not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Peter here was a, was a hypocrite. Matter of fact, he was being prejudiced, eating with the Gentiles till the Jews show up. Then he's worried about the Jews and what they're going to think. And then he separates himself to the Jews. And Paul says, I, ha I had to withstand him to the face. Did that probably seem a little confrontational at the time? Yeah. But to be honest, I don't think you could have found a better friend than what you found in Paul right there, who was willing to tell Peter that there was an issue. Yeah, we oftentimes know ourselves best. It's also true that oftentimes we've got a, a speck and or got a got a uh, got our own log in our eye, and we can't deal with our own problems. And sometimes it takes somebody looking from the outside to see the problem that we ourselves can't see. And you have examples of that all throughout the scriptures. So we do know ourselves best, but the problem is, is because we know ourselves best, oftentimes we're blind in looking at ourselves truly. Let's talk for a second about love, love of the truth and knowing ourselves. Well, salvation depends on knowing the truth. We don't need to spend much time on that. There are so many passages that we could talk about that talk about the fact that one has to know the truth in order to uh, be faithful. The thing is, is as we talk about salvation depending on a response to the truth, we know this. Some people respond to the truth and some don't. And that could include ourselves. As I'm going through this, I'm thinking in my mind about a number of things. And we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to receive truth or do I reject it? Let me give you an example. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. <clears throat> Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice this. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, let me pause for a minute. There are people who have never become a Christian, who have become a Christian, who will reject the truth. There are some that will receive it. There are people who are Christians now. Who, who will learn something new and receive it, and there are those who will reject that which is given to them. I began to think a little bit about the parable of the sower. You could go, really go down to Luke 8, 11 and, and continue reading. But in verse 15, he says this, But that on that good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now, as you begin to talk about truth, many today will say something like this. Well, truth is extremely subjective. <clears throat> truth is not a, 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 a one-size-fits-all. And so you, you can't really try to pinpoint down what truth is. When you, I could give you a number of passages, but again, you look at John 8.32, and it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When Jesus was standing right there in front of Pilate, Pilate asked the question, Well, what is truth? It was standing right there in front of him. He couldn't see it. 
The same thing is true oftentimes with us. The truth is there, but because we, we've got that plank in our eye, we sometimes just can't see it. And I'm not necessarily talking about being a hypocrite. Sometimes we're just not very good at seeing our own issues. As we talk about truth, though, I'm not just talking about doctrinal truth. Now, let me get this straight. Doctrinal truth is needed, but there's more truth than that. There's also the truth about ourselves, the truth about the things we believe, the truth about the things that we're involved in, the things that we do, and also the truth about the sins that we need to repent of. That's a big one right there. Listen to 1 John 1, 8 through 10. I think this summarizes up, and we don't need to spend much time on it. But if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I don't think the majority of Christians would ever take the stance that they never sin. I don't know anybody that takes that stance. I think most of us here would all agree that we sin, hopefully not on a regular basis, but we do sin. We mess up, and sometimes we know exactly what those sins are, and sometimes we do not. <clears throat> There's probably no greater of a demand on our courage than when we are actually faced with coming to the recognition or the understanding that we are in a, a sinful position, or that we are involved in things we ought not to be, or that we believe things that we should not believe. Cain is really a good example. <clears throat> you go back to Genesis 4.10, and Cain, when he was faced with the truth of his actions, here's the interesting part. He didn't just lie to God. He lied both to himself, and then he lied to God. Genesis 4.10. And you'll find a number of people that will do that. And as I bring that up, I want you to understand there are people like that. There are people outside the church who will lie to themselves and try to lie to God. There are people in the church who will lie to themselves and try to lie to God. But there's also the opposite side. There are those who, when they hear the truth, receive the truth, and then they want to do something based on that. And a good example, I think that one of the best, would be for us to go and look at Acts 2.36-41. through 41. Now again, you got to remember, these are people out in the crowd who previously were chanting, you know, crucify him, crucify him, and here they hear the truth. Now again, some will reject it, some will accept it. But notice starting there in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Peter, as he stands before them, says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. There are times when we we'll hear the truth uh, and, and we'll accept it. There are times we'll reject it. And we have, we have examples uh, of both of those throughout the New Testament and even in the Old Testament. But in order for us to be honest with ourselves... There's some things that are required. We have to know the truth, and we have to want to obey the truth really more than anything else. I think oftentimes it boils down really to just that. And as I began to think a little bit about this, it has to be one of those things where when we've learned something that we had not learned before, or, or maybe for the non-Christian when they've heard something that is new to them, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, we can't base our concerns on self-image or personal desires. Now, that happens for a lot of people. But we have to, once we know the truth, have to want to obey the truth. Because if somebody's only worried really about their self-image, they're not, they're not fit for the kingdom. And we can look at a number of passages, but I think back to when Jesus was giving the parable of the Pharisee praying in the temple. And if you go back and you look at that, it shows just how out of touch we as individuals sometimes can be especially when it comes to how we think we stand versus how we actually stand in God's sight. Listen to, I'm going to go to Luke 18, 9 through 14, because I want you to think about this, because this is a person who, who thinks he is righteous. Now, there are a number of us in the church, and we hope that we are. We hope that we're righteous. But there are a number of people in the world who believe that they're righteous in God's sight who are not. And this is a good example to come to. Luke 18, 9 
And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Okay, let me, let me pause. These are people that think they're righteous, right? They think they're doing the right thing. And you have a lot of people uh, out in the world today and even in the church that would fit that category. But notice this, and they despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm... I want you guys to notice that he's praying with himself. It's not really a, a prayer to God here, as you see. I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Let me pause for a second. He forgot to talk about how, how humble he was, didn't he? This is a guy who personally thinks that he's, he's righteous in God's sight. He's not a very good evaluator of himself. Notice the next person. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Here's the point. Some people are more worried about what other people think or what they even think of themselves than they are about, about how they're actually supposed to be in alignment with the Scriptures. And as I think about the two people here who are praying, you've got one who's, who's really spending his whole focus on how great he is and all of the wonderful things that he's done, and the other one, the publican, who's very humbly willing to admit that he's a sinner, that he's messed up. And I think for each of us as Christians, we have to get to the point where we have that attitude where we have to realize that sometimes we may have a wrong idea or we may have done something that's wrong, but we've got to have that humble attitude where if that were to, to come to our knowledge or if we were to learn that, we would correct it immediately. Now let's, let's talk about testing ourselves. I'm going to give you just a couple of questions and probably some questions you really hadn't pondered in a while. Ask yourselves, when you pray, do you pray to see yourselves as God sees you? I don't think most of us probably pray that prayer. But I think if we were to go back and to spend a little bit of time thinking about how do you see yourself right now as opposed to how God actually sees you? For many of us, the way we see ourselves may be how God sees us. And we may be doing very well. There are a number of those uh, of people, though, who who they see themselves as doing exceptionally well spiritually, but they're not. Listen to Psalms 19, 12 through 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the, greatest, from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength. And my Redeemer. I would hope that as I am honest and am, am looking at myself and the things that I believe and the things that I do, I would hope that I see myself the way that God sees me. Ask yourself this, do you, do you pray for friends who actually love your souls more than they just love having you as a friend? I'm talking about friends who, if you were to fall in some area or to sin, would you have the kind of friend that would come and not excuse it or ignore it? I go back and I think of the friends that I used to have prior to becoming a Christian. And I can say this with 100% honesty. I don't believe any of them were worried about my soul. They weren't. They were my friends, but they weren't worried about my soul. And the same person who may come and tell me something out of concern for my soul, even though it may come across as confrontational, maybe even though it may hurt my feelings, that's really the kind of true friends that we need, right? Because I'll be honest with you, if you think about most of you, the people you know in the world, I don't think any of them are worried about your soul. Ask yourself, how does God see you? Ask yourself, are you looking for true friends like that? Galatians 4.16, you remember when Paul said this, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I would hope that I always have a friend who is willing to, no matter how hard it is, come and tell me the truth. Ask yourself, do you actually pray to be placed in the situations or circumstances where uh, you will actually see your true character, that's oftentimes something that we don't want. Because that only normally comes about when we're dealing with trials and hardships. 
you've heard many people say you really don't know what a man's made of until he's been put to the fire, right? That's a hard prayer to ask yourselves. Can I be placed in situations where I can honestly find out what my true character is? Ask yourself, do you pray for your secrets to be exposed? And if they were actually exposed, would you be happy about it? And would you be thrilled that honesty was being forced upon you because of the issues? I think for many of us, the answer would be no. And I talked a little bit about this. Many people today are very protective people. We don't tell people certain things because they may not like it or because they may disagree with it. We may not tell people certain things because we're embarrassed about it or we think that it would, it would uh, make them like us less. There's a number of reasons. But for many of us, this is the number one issue and why the number one reason why issues aren't corrected. We simply don't talk about it. People don't know about it. And oftentimes it's never brought to light. Ask yourself this, with that being said then, do you pray for all those issues that you actually have or those incorrect beliefs possibly that you may have? Do you pray for those to actually be brought out into the light? You know, sometimes when you have issues, the best thing you can do is kind of deal with them head on. Listen to 1 John 3, sorry, John 3, 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. There's a number of things in our lives and even maybe related to to doctrinal issues or spiritual things that we don't like to talk about. But, you know, in all areas where we have a problem, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in a, in a relationship at work, whether it's in a, with a doctrinal belief or whatever, none of those issues will ever be solved until they're brought to the light. And I think back when I was uh, doing my class on, on marriage for my master's program, how many of you guys know a, a marriage that is extremely successful when everything going on is hidden or shoved under the rug or never dealt with? You guys know what, what that actually causes is for anger and tension and anxiety and hostility to continue to build and build and build. And it's like a, it's like a pressure cooker. You can only build for so long. Eventually it's going to explode. If those things don't come to the light and we don't deal with them, whatever they may be, eventually it's going to, it's going to burst open. Now, these are just a couple of the things that we ought to think about as far as questions. But questions like this, they're not oftentimes, they're not oftentimes asked, asked, and they're oftentimes probably even less answered because they make us feel extremely uncomfortable. And I think I understand that. They make us sometimes see the areas where we're inadequate. They make us uh, look at those things maybe from a different light that we don't really want to look at. But here's the thing. As you begin to think about us as individuals, and in knowing ourselves. God knows us better than anyone. Listen to Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God knows everything about us. Ask yourselves this. Do you genuinely love his truth? I think the answer here is I look at people, would it, I would have to assume that almost everyone would say, yeah. Yeah, I love his truth. I spend time looking at his word. Do we, lo do we love it enough to seek out those who would help us either to continue to learn more about it or who love us enough to correct us when they find out that Maybe we're contrary to it. Listen to 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. And I bring this passage up because it's something that's needed in the church. It's something that's needed in the home. It's something that's really needed in all walks of life for us as Christians because there have been a number who have turned from the faith. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I think many people, when they turn away from the truth and they turn unto fables, it's really because even though they know themselves, they can't be honest with themselves. 
And I think in many situations, they're not, there's not someone who, who can come and, for whatever reason, bring them back to their senses. We need to be praying for brethren, for spouses, for family members, for friends, to be able to come and, and to help us when we are at, uh, at, at odds with the Bible. And to do it in a way that would make us want to follow after the truth. Listen to 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And I'm thinking about what Larry said during Bible study, about that nice, calm, casual talk at the dinner table. We sometimes have not very casual talks at my house too, Larry. That's not our goal. The goal is for us, as we find here in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, it says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Let me pause for a minute. That's sometimes hard, especially when you're talking about an emotional situation. It's even harder in families, especially because if you come from a family member, or if you come from a family where things are brought out and spoken and open, and I'll be honest, my kids are just as, they get just as fired up as I do. I wonder where they get that from. And sometimes we'll have conversations that get heated. I don't love them any less. I love them just as much. Uh, I think, and oftentimes, we as brethren, although we're supposed to strive and be gentle, we sometimes butt heads like the goats that we used to have on the farm. But we can walk away still loving one another when we do it. He says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Oftentimes, we in families do oppose ourselves, and we don't even know it. We need someone to come and to help us to see right. He says then, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know, I thought a lot about this throughout the week and I didn't have anybody in mind. But I had a general sense, a general sense of issues not only in our personal lives but in the church. Yeah, we oftentimes know ourselves best. We oftentimes also, though, turn a blind eye to the things that we're involved in. And it's because, again, we have a hard time looking at our own actions or our own beliefs, and we lessen the importance of those things that we know are not contrary to God's will. As we've already seen a number of times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was somebody who loved somebody else enough to come and to, to sit down and to talk with them and to give them an understanding. We know that the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. But here's really the question in all areas, and it's a hard one. Can you really be honest with yourself? I think sometimes we can, but I think at other times it takes someone who really loves us to be able to help us in those areas. And again, I don't have anything specific in mind, but I do know this. We've all struggled with it. There are things I can look at with, within myself and say, you know what? That's a bigger issue than what you thought it is, or you need to deal with that in a different way, or you're not as effective as you should be. And so I ask you as I draw this to a close, look within yourself. Challenge yourself in all things. Ask yourself if everything that you believe and everything that you're doing is in alignment with God's will. If it's not, I pray you have a, a Christian friend who can help you through whatever that situation is. I ask the same thing for anyone here who is not yet a Christian. Again, I want you to go back and, and dismiss everything you've ever been taught regarding about how to become a Christian. Dismiss all of that. I had to do that at one point in my life. But go back and just look at the biblical examples. It was very simple. People were out preaching and teaching the gospel. They were teaching that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And, and we have to believe that. Matter of fact, Jesus made it very clear uh, when he said, I am. Jesus was God in the flesh. And he made it clear if you don't believe that, you're going to die in your sins, John 8, 24. But when people did hear people teaching that, and they understood why Jesus came and why he shed his blood so that sins could be remitted, and they understood that the consequences of sin, they're willing to repent of them, Acts 17.30. They're also willing to confess Christ. Again, he was the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. Then they were willing to be immersed in water, just as Jesus had commanded, Mark 16.16. 16. You don't find anything different than that at all in the Scriptures. You find that out in the religious world around us, but in the Bible, very simple. They heard it. They believed it. They repented of sins. They confessed Christ, and they were immersed in water. It was as simple as that.
And I got to the point at one point where I finally understood that and I hadn't done it. If you're here and you've not done that, you can still do that this very hour. You can be immersed and be added to the church. <clears throat> if you're here and you're a Christian, again, I ask you, look within yourselves. Ask yourselves all of those things regarding your belief and your actions. And if there's an area where you realize you're struggling, we'd love to pray for you. And probably even better would be if you could let another Christian know who might be able to help you in that situation. If there's a way we can assist, you can simply come forward as we stand and we sing a song of invitation.